I hope you enjoyed the first of our concurrent sessions and the mini movement session presented by Energy Health. While I've got your attention, just a few reminders. Don't forget to engage in the portal to increase your points and stand to win some fabulous prizes. Visit our exhibitors at their virtual booths. We'll be giving prizes away throughout the three days of the conference. And just a reminder, some of our lucky in attendees will have a chance to win the following. A Fitbit Versa 2 Smart Fitness Watch, courtesy of sponsor Grosner Engineering. And who wouldn't love this? A bottle of Verve and a box of chocolates with thanks to GJK. More food and wine with a hamper from Capital Insight. And for nature lovers, a beautiful field guide to the birds of Australia by Simpson and Day with thanks to Plan On Software. Something that will make us feel good thanks to our friends at Ambius, a desktop container and plant, plus an obligation-free consultation with a Plantscape consultant. Lastly, from our hosts, ATEM and TEFMA, we'll also be giving away three $100 gift vouchers of the winner's choice, Coles, Meyer, movie vouchers, good food vouchers, whatever you'd like to, to the value of $100 for each lucky recipient. And there will be six of them over the next three days. Click your points tally to see a list of ways to earn. The more points you accumulate, the more tickets you have in the prize draws. We all know that 10C delegates love a challenge. There are some trivia questions within the goals to help you boost your points. So visit the exhibitors and you may find some answers to the questions. Get posting in the event stream, share your experiences and thoughts, engage with your fellow delegates. Each session has a discussion forum and a live Q&A box. We want you to be as connected with the speakers as possible, so please do not be shy. Do visit the On Demand Gallery and watch the videos and content during the breaks and feel free to leave questions for the presenters to answer when they are available. Now, on with the show. Welcome back. If you've just joined us again, it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, the passionate Toltu Tufa, presenting on the death of your native dialect, why the language you speak matters. Thank you, Arm Architecture, for sponsoring this very important session. A little bit about Toltu. She is a psychologist who has worked across a wide range of industries from sales and education to health and the justice system. As an award-winning educator and TED speaker, Toltu is known for reviving Africa's fourth most widely spoken native language, Afan Oromo. She has been invited by governments and organisations around the world to consult on matters relating to education and native language retention. With over 20 years of community and educational experience, Toltu is obsessed with finding new ways to create connected and vibrant communities. Please welcome to the TEMC stage, Toltu Tufa. But first, here's a quick video that perfectly summarises Toltu's journey. My name is Toltu Tufa. I'm of dual heritage, so my mum's Turkish, my dad's Oromo, and both of them went out of their way to teach us their language. The difference between the two was that my identity as a Turkish person was never contested, whereas my identity as an Oromo person was contested every single time. As far as I was concerned, it was a secret language of sort that, that only my dad knew how to speak. <laughs> The Oromo people represent the largest Indigenous population in the Horn of Africa, particularly within Ethiopia. 
the Oromo people's language was banned for more than 100 years. And during that time, Oromo people were not allowed to speak their language and they were threatened with imprisonment and for some people, murder. When Dad arrived in Australia in 1984, there were literally no Oromo people. He was the first. My father taught me how to speak the Oromo language and eventually he enrolled me into a weekend school. And they gave me the opportunity not just to learn, but also to teach the language. When I saw that every other weekend school I went to had resources in their hands, except for the Oromos. So I thought, what if I just made my own worksheets? And then I thought to myself, I wonder if Oromo people living around the world have a similar issue. And then after that, um, I created the books. It's dark here. I think these books are a reflection of what the Oromo community has to offer the entire world. I was invited to attend the 2019 Irecha Peace Forum, which uh, coincides with a Thanksgiving ceremony that was being held in the capital city of Oromia in Ethiopia for the first time in 150 years. There were about 7 million people in attendance. People had come on horseback. Uh, women and men were dressed from all the different regions. The heads of states uh, had arrived. It was very intense. It was overwhelming. It was beautiful. I was delighted to be invited with such open arms to a place where once upon a time I would have been imprisoned for such a thing. <laughs> Handing out those books to the children there um, was something I gave as a gift and their eyes really lit up. And I remember the first time I saw cartoons that looked like me or animations that were brown like me. I remember thinking, wow, I don't need to wish to have, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes because that, that's what I grew up with. I remember how I felt and when I saw the children that I was giving the books to, I saw that look in their eyes and I thought, this is, it's an addictive feeling. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have my speech televised uh, on live TV. So essentially the whole nation was welcome to watch. And it was an opportunity I used to show people that critical thinking and unity is what we need for our future. Australia, we kept school It was surreal. It was very surreal. Uh, people knew my name. People knew my history. People were talking about my life when they came to ask and pose for photographs. And people would call my name down the street. I don't think they're particularly interested in me. I think they're more interested in what I represented and the representation of hope that somebody during the time of difficulty when people were too scared to say they were Oromo, that I was busy rallying people outside saying it's time to raise the language, to raise our identity, to raise our children. We need to show the world who we are. And welcome. It is so wonderful to be able to present. I'm guessing some of you are at home, maybe eating your lunch uh, and sorting yourself out for what you're going to do for the rest of the afternoon. So what I wanted to do is share my story with you. I, one of the reasons was because I realised uh, this is an audience who's geared for a very special population. Often when we look at making change or, so to speak, uh, you look around the world and, you know, research has shown um, only about five population will have access to something like a university degree. And people that move on from universities are often positioned to become one of the most powerful people in the world. So it can become really easy to think that you're just a cog in a wheel at a university in a very privileged country where, you know, um, everyone's at the same level and doing the same thing. And I think it's important sometimes to take a bit of a back step and realise how much of how much uh, of a profound piece of work that you're doing as an organisation um, 
as an individual that can really impact the world. So that's part of the reason why I've chosen to be here and I'm the one who's honoured to be presenting to all of you. I hope you can take, take away something from what I have to share. So I'll bring up my presentation here. <clears throat> and I guess when we talk about native dialect, um, it goes, as, as it said on the video, that I am of Oromo heritage, which is the largest Indigenous population uh, uh, within Ethiopia today. I think it goes without say um, that I acknowledge the Indigenous people uh, on the land on whom I'm presenting to you today and respect, uh, pay respects to their elders past and present. Um, one of the first things that I wanted to share with you was Afan, which is the name of the organisation that I developed myself. Uh, when I was in my early 20s. So I was still in university at the time. The people who inspired my work was uh, mum and dad, and this is where they are. So they've been married for like 32 years now. And um, while they don't look particularly uh, distinguished now, back in the 80s, um, they were a bit of a hoot because people couldn't believe that my mum would marry someone like my dad. My dad couldn't believe he could marry someone like my mum. And so when we grew up as children, we had so much uh, to offer the world, but it didn't always feel that way. And because it never felt that way, it was easy for me to feel othered. And that's often how I felt as a child growing up. So no matter, you know, I felt like I had to work extra hard or be extra friendly or extra polite and extra everything um, just to have a seat, not even at the table, but to even be in the room. And so living with people like my parents, I feel like they, they equipped me with the opportunity uh, to recognise my own strengths and never to question them. And... My dad in teaching the Oromo language was very interesting and this is what I wanted to talk to you about. I created something that, would you believe, has never been done at the time. Uh, in the history of the Oromo language, what we take for granted, like weekend schools, so I've got, got some of my, you know, things here that I've made. These are typical things that you find in a classroom, you know, grade prep, grade one, grade two, Nothing like this existed for the Oromo people. So all of these people, um, for one reason or another, due to politics for the most part, left the country because they couldn't move to another country and um, had families and children who were no longer able to speak that language. And it put um, the global Oromo communities in a very difficult position. So they would say things like, and our jobs as pilots and doctors, um, so that we can have a better life here, and we ran away so we could speak our language, but now our children don't speak it. What do we do? And so it was from there where I started my works, essentially thinking maybe if I just help the community school that I'm involved uh, with, maybe that'll do. And so obviously, and the reality is that so many of my learnings, it wasn't an overnight thing. I felt like I was going into a temporary role as a volunteer. And what I realised was that, you know, it was up to where I chose to focus and what I made of the situation that could make a difference. There were people who were so much more educated than me, who had more of a following than me, who were older than me, more experienced than me, richer than me. Um, and what I did was I stayed focused on what I could do. So I started really, really small. I started by creating uh, posters and alphabet series, uh, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z in the Oromo language. And I may not have known the whole language, but I did know how to create something beautiful from what I saw uh, in other communities growing up as a multilingual child. So it was really just literally copying what I saw in other communities and adapting it um, for my community. And it sounds really easy, but the reality is, is a lot of the times there were definitely a lot of tears. Uh, there were so many things I got got wrong. There were so many times where I made mistakes. There was one occasion where um, I accidentally called a woman from a wrong tribe and she actually picked up her shoe and threw it at me while there were journalists in the room. It was um, an eye-opening experience and very sobering, that's for sure. There was so much struggle um, because in order to create, you can imagine that when you people develop hope in something, and you might find these stakeholders who are so vest invested in what you're doing that they will try and um, sway you or change you or insist that you need to um, 
go on their path or include their opinion. And so being that cog in the middle, it's so important how you perceive your situation and how you're able to harness everyone's strength uh, in order to achieve you know a goal and so I remember the first uh, my first poster that I ever made uh, and this this is exactly what my poster looked like this simple stuff um, my father when he saw this um, cried like was actually howling when he saw this he cried and cried and cried and said I've never seen anything you know so beautiful um, in my whole life uh, and this is coming from a man who taught me his language by using a pen and a sheet of paper, by using, um, you know, books that were written up from 20 years ago. That was font 10. And so what they gave me, I went and developed into something further. So these are sort of what my posters look like. Um, and I and I got the whole world involved too. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about how you're able to involve people in something that only you know about right? People may not know or be interested, but how do you drum up, how do you drum up that interest? How do you, um, I guess, you know, move away the naysayers, uh, so to speak? So these are the book series that I made. I made um, the box set that I showed you earlier, flashcards. And the, the reality is that I made sure that in everything that I could do, I took responsibility for what I was able to do. And I think that's something we tend to forget. We keep thinking about what this person could be doing and should be doing, and often we forget about how much power we have ourselves to be able to achieve success. What success looks like is something that can be defined by you. And it doesn't need to be the end goal by which we define our success. There are so many milestones that should be celebrated along the way. And, you know, communicating that is just as important because when you take responsibility for what you can do, you will soon discover what you're not able to do. And the more honest you are about what you cannot do or don't have access to, then the next thing you can do, and this is the second thing that I did, I guess, to summarise, is um, leverage what you have to attain what you don't have. Right. So at the time when I was developing this, I was a uni student. I had something on my hands called time, something I don't have too much of right now. So I had time on my hands. I didn't have the money. Right. I had the know how. I didn't have the knowledge. So in order to be able to leverage what I need to people and found those people who I could harness into the vision, I didn't try and convince one person to do everything, I told them. I'm planning to make a poster. I'm planning on releasing this to uh, communities. And if they're interested, they can come and help me. Uh, are you able to help me with doing the spell check for these letters? Are you able to help me to say if I'm using the appropriate words? And I guess the biggest leverage that I used was to put myself out there. Again, when I knew what I didn't have, and for me, that was money. I didn't want to waste my time if no one was going to invest in what I was about to do. So I made a video and I released that on social media and among Oromo people, the video went viral very quickly. So I said to them, if you're interested in this vision, if you want to support me in doing this, I need you to um, give me $50,000 and then I will deliver. And so the way I arranged for that is... Um, I gave people different options. So those who had money could help in this way. Those who didn't have money could help in that way. And I essentially got communities to suggest fundraisers. And within, so I said, oh, and I gave a four-week timeline. I'm like, whatever you can give me in four weeks will help me to determine whether I can actually, you know, do this or not. And so within four, within two weeks, um, 25 cities around the world sought watched my video, got in touch and took responsibility, saying we are going to do a fundraiser within the four weeks that you're trying to raise. And so my bringing people together. So I was able to set up a calendar, broadcast what everyone was doing, saying on this day it will be in Egypt and that day it will be in Kenya and this day it will be in the US. And communities started competing with one another for something they all wanted, which was their children, to learn their language.
And I think the most touching response, the most touching event for me was um, from the community in Egypt. There's a big refugee population there at the moment. And they said, look, we are all United Nations mandated refugees, but we we don't have money. But if you give us some money to hire a hall, we can throw a really big party and drum up some attention for what you're doing. So even though they didn't raise money for me, they said, we want to be the first event, the, the first event for fundraising. So they they did that and about 800 people turned up. They had me on a projector and they were, it was just the, the adrenaline from that really pushed out to the rest of the world. And, you know, there were people in developed countries saying, well, if that's what Egypt can do, surely we can do better. And it had like sort of a flow on effect. And within six weeks, instead of the 50000 I ended up raising $123,000 cash. So the community was on board. And in order to thank them, I did a consultation around the world, showed them my product, got their feedback, and uh, included it within. Included it with included it within my work. And when I actually published everything, I used because I raised so much more money. I, I I apportioned a budget to go back to the top five countries, <clears throat> take the books with me, and give it to the people who raised the most. And that was the the formula, the third, which was my realisation that I was able to attain success when I enabled other people to join in my success by whatever means they had. And that was the most important thing. So what happened was um, the whole project took over about two years. And in that time, I had, for example, in one of my books, which was originally meant to be an ABC book, I had an older woman participate. and 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 I just said, what do you think of this? And she said, this is amazing, but I can't help but say that you're ruining my experience of the language. And and everyone was like, oh, stop being a naysayer. You're an old woman. She's young. You need to encourage Toltu to keep going. And it was important for me to hear what she had to say. And what she said changed the course of my books, all of my series. And she said, I speak the language, but I don't know how to read and write. And when, when I buy these books,
always and and that's the mantra on which I used to end and do the entire Afan series. And so what do you say to people who are already at the best at the best best of CEO? How do you speak to someone who is so committed to excellence that technically they don't even have to improve? Keeping in mind that there's a better way of doing things. It's the reason why there's 100 books on management, so many different methodologies to running a course or a program and not program because there is always a new way, a vision, a scaffold, a way of doing things. And all of those me, people like us who think, and what if we gave that a go? Because the people who are university students, these are people who are literally able to be moulded in ways of our future. People like you in their lives. So I would never take for granted that you have on people around you, whether it's your colleague who's come from another country who's never been recognised as an individual, who may, uh, you know, thrive and strive for everything they wanted in there to get it here. It could be the person who was born and raised in this country, the first family to get a university education. It could be that person who feels so much pressure from space where they're valued and respected for who they are as an individual. None of you have a backstory, just like I do. And coming onto these spaces for me is not about showing because I never put those accolades on myself. They were things people, my community, recognise and push. And what I will claim is that I question my strengths. Your strengths are 